Hi, Elena. How are you? Hey, Carlos, nice to see you. Nice to see you again. We're almost ready to start. Okay, so um, the WebEx here is working, I hope, well. So people are joining us here. And uh, we also have now the YouTube uh, link. So if there is any problem um, with students who cannot uh, join us or other people, they can they can attend through the web, uh, the YouTube. Um, and I see it is also working, so we are fine, I think so. Um, okay, so let's wait for one to uh, minutes and then we may start. Um, I see people still coming, so. And the Google folder we are using uh, has all information. So the links and all links are available there. So people can find the links and everything. And if they have problems with the WebEx uh, webinar registration or anything, they can find the links and it will be okay. Um, so let's check uh, that your slides can be um viewed somehow so we can i mean let me see uh yes okay so you have now permission and everything so you can upload and share content perfect this working And it's here, yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. You can see everything. Yes, you see it. Yes, yes, everything is here. Right. So thank you. Thank you. So more people are coming, so we will start in one or two minutes. Um, it's the second lecture, so we don't need a very long introduction, but I will, I can say a few words and then you may start and we can have a discussion. Now people probably know how we are going to work with the webinar. Um, Okay, so I think we are almost ready. So if I can I can say a few words and I can welcome all of you. So dear colleagues and, and friends and students, I welcome you all to the second lecture of the online version of the series of lectures, Ukrainian Scholars in Athens, organized by the Linguistic Society of Europe, the Faculty of English Language and Literature, and the MA Program in English Language, uh, Linguistics and Translation, and the Opora Center of the Ukrainian Community of Athens. Our online gathering again today demonstrates our continuous, without end, and in any circumstances, essential scientific real support of our Ukrainian colleagues and of all people of Ukraine. Our today's introduction will be shorter and we will have more time for discussion. Dr. Elena Elena will offer us the second lecture of this phase of the series of lectures. Uh, the second lecture is on languages in Ukraine and the Ukrainian language. Uh, today's lecture aims at exploring historical and cultural perspectives of languages in Ukraine with a particular emphasis on the Ukrainian language, beginning with an overview of Ukraine's linguistic heritage. 
the lecture will uh, reveal the specific historical circumstances that shaped the development of Ukrainian. The lecture aims at discussing the connection between languages and identity in Ukraine, as well as the, dis the discourses uh, in Ukraine in the context of the ongoing war. The lecture also examines the use of Ukrainian as official language in Ukraine and the challenges facing language preservation and promotion. Let me remind you some information on our invited professor. Alina Ilina is an associate professor of the Faculty of Philosophy at Taras Shevchenko National University of Kyiv, Ukraine, an associate researcher at the Research Center for the History of Transformations, University of Vienna, Austria. Uh, her research interests include the history of European philosophy and Ukrainian studies. In 2019, she earned a habilitation degree of the Doctor of Philosophical Sciences for Taras Shevchenko National University of Kyiv. Previously, she worked as a senior research fellow at the National Institute of Ukrainian Studies and uh, World History of the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine. Alina is a co-founder of the Ukrainian Society for Digital History of Philosophy and the Center for Austrian-Ukrainian Cultural Studies in Austria. And we hope to establish a similar center in Athens too, probably in the near future. At the Rasevchenko National University of Kyiv, she participates in Ukrainian translation of classical philosophical texts and teaches courses on Ukrainian studies, among others. The lecture will be of around one hour because the, the lectures are online and because we would like to promote discussion between us and a lively webinar. You can use the chat and you can ask us to make you a WebEx panelist to unmute your microphone, open a camera when you have a question. So Alina, we are delighted to be here with you today, and we are looking forward to attending and participating to your second lecture. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Lavides, for organizing this, this wonderful event and for uh, this um, solidarity with Ukraine. I'm uh, very honored to be part of this wonderful event. And today, uh, my lecture will be devoted actually to languages of Ukraine and the Ukrainian language, uh, as, as you were already told. I will try to give some historical introduction to Ukrainian language and historical explanation about how the language situation and language identities uh, were developed in Ukraine and what challenges, were, uh, occur, uh, uh, what challenges did, it have, did they have during this development. I will start from uh, the explanation of what is actually the uh, official language of Ukraine, which is Ukrainian language. What is Ukrainian language? Let me make some introductionary remarks. Ukrainian language is a language uh, that belongs to the Slavonic group of languages, actually. The group of languages, language families, uh, this is a big group of languages from 20 languages. Uh, Ukrainian, Polish, Bulgarian, Serbo Croatian, and, uh, and other languages are the part of this group. Around 40 to 45 millions of people in the world speak Ukrainian, both inside and outside of Ukraine. So it's uh, around uh, number 37 of the, in the list of most spoken languages in the world. Ukrainian language, we call it Ukrainska Mova, uh, use Cyrillic alphabet, and it is a very old language that uh, started its development uh, around the fifth century of um, around fifth century. Uh, it is known that the uh, first written two first written words in Ukrainian language belong to the year 448. So. Uh, Fifth century is a century when the first Ukrainian words were written. Ukrainian language uh, is uh, a part of languages that uh, origins from so-called Proto-Slavic language. Uh, its separate development, Ukrainian language, began uh, in 11th century. Traditionally, uh, scholars tell that there are two types of Ukrainian language. The first one is so-called Old Ukrainian language, which is the literary language of Ukraine from the 11th till 18th century. 
uh, and uh, to, uh, the first Ukrainian books in all Ukrainian language belong to the medieval Ukraine, to the state that was known as uh, Kiev and Rus. Uh, here you can see uh, several of the most prominent and most the most famous examples of the written books on this language. Uh, the Ukrainian language has gone through its historical evolution, resulting in the development of two distinct forms, Old Ukrainian and Modern Ukrainian language. Uh, today, I will uh, make more uh, accent on the development of Modern Ukrainian language, because there are a lot of interesting things that we can tell about Old Ukrainian language as well. Uh, but uh, as long as we don't have so many time, we will concentrate our attention on the development of Ukrainian language, mostly since 19th century. The first book written on moder in modern Ukrainian language belonged to 1798. And uh, yeah, actually it is uh, the first uh, book uh, that was uh, written in uh, Ukrainian language it was a book uh, called innate uh, by ukrainian poet and writer ivan kotlerevsky uh, who marked the beginning of a new chapter in the development of ukrainian language uh, and that was the first book in vernacular language uh, at that time uh, Ukraine, in 1798, Ukraine did not have its own statehood. It was a part of uh, another country, Ukrainians were the minorities. And uh, Ukrainian language, uh, modern Ukrainian language, the spoken language, uh, did not have its own representation uh, in a written form. So this is the first written form in a spoken language. Uh, uh, in, in a spoken vernacular, la vernacular language. Uh, this book uh, played a very significant role in the development of modern Ukrainian language. This book was very interesting from several uh, points of view. First of all, it was uh, a book uh, that uh, was um, that has a very interesting plot. It was based actually on um, uh, Greco-Roman mythology. It was based uh, on uh, the myths uh, about Aeneas. Uh, but uh, it was also a mock, po uh, mock poem uh, that uh, was related to quite an interesting, a specific Ukrainian historical context. As long as uh, the main character of uh, Kotlerevsky uh, poem, uh, which is based actually on this ancient character of Aeneas, is represented as Ukrainian Cossacks. So let me tell several words about uh, Ukrainian Cossacks. Ukrainian Cossacks uh, were, um, uh, were uh, some sort of uh, legendary people, legendary people of Ukraine that had a total statehood uh, since, uh, since maybe it's not very, um, very, very well known uh, when exactly uh, the state would appear, but they were known in history since 15th century. However, uh, in uh, 16, 17, uh, and 18th century, Ukrainian Cossacks had uh, their own uh, uh, autonomous state, autonomous region. It was called the Zaporizhian host, about, or in Ukrainian, the Zaporizhka siege. Uh, they represented Ukrainian elite. And uh, they were a very significant part of Ukrainian uh, culture, so Ukraine, Ukrainian Cossacks. They were warriors. Uh, they participated in many uh, European, uh, uh, important European events. For example, in Vienna, there is a monument to Ukrainian Cossacks uh, that was 
um, built because of uh, their uh, participation in the battle uh, in the battle against Ottoman Empire. Again, uh, in, 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 uh, so they, they were known not only in Ukraine but also outside Ukraine. But also in Ukraine, Ukrainian Cossacks they were a very um, important part of the society. Uh, they uh, were known as uh, people who fighted for their freedom. They wanted to obtain their full independence. They were known for their fighting for place. Also, they uh, during uh, their main activity, especially in 17th and 19th century, they made a very significant contribution to culture. They uh, built uh, uh, monasteries and churches. They uh, built schools, they uh, donated um, money for the development of education in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, they uh, were a very significant part of Ukrainian culture. Also, they have their own spirituality and they were some sort of superheroes of their time. Everybody wanted to be similar to Cossacks and it still uh, exists in Ukrainian culture. In Ukraine, people very often tell to uh, uh, mothers very often to tell to their uh, sons, don't cry because you are Ukrainian Cossack. So which means that you are brave, you are great, and you uh, represent every, everything the best that can be, that can be seen as uh, related to freedom and to uh, bravery and to a uh, strong part of human nature. However, uh, in um, the beginning of uh, 18th century, the Parisian siege, the place of Ukrainian Cossacks was destroyed. And uh, this event, the liquidation of uh, this Ukrainian Cossack state, was uh, uh, a very um, tragic event for Ukrainian culture. As long as this place was abolished, uh, there was some less nostalgic feelings to uh, this state that Ukraine had but did not achieve. And Ivan Kuchlerevsky, he writes his uh, poem with the idea uh, that uh, Ukrainian Aeneas becomes a hero searching for a new land after the fall of the Zaporizhian siege. And that is where there is uh, a common thing, that is where we can find common uh, common lines, common plot between uh, the story of uh, ancient hero Aeneas, uh, who uh, searched for a new land after the fall of Troy, and Ukrainian Cossack Aeneas, as, it, as he was represented in Kutnerevsky poem, uh, who uh, searched for a new land for Ukrainian Cossack. Ukrainian uh, idea that was placed into this story uh, mostly had a lot of anti-colonial interpretation. As long as many scholars think that uh, Kotlerevsky represents in one of the characters of this poem, Catherine II, the Russian empress who was close to the Parisian host. But also another moment about this poem is that it is not a heroic poem, it is a, a burlesque poem, so it is fun, it is very catchy. If there are some Ukrainians here, I'm sure that you remember and all Ukrainians remember uh, by heart uh, lines from this poem because they are fun, they are interesting, and uh, this poem is just very brilliant in the way it's done. You can see this on the slide, so maybe I will give you like 20 seconds to look through this poem. Uh, this is actually the introduction, the beginning to this poem. Uh, where this representation of a character occurs. As you see, Aeneas was a robust guy, Cossack full of beam. So this is a very uh, famous, all Ukrainians know the Ukrainian, all Ukrainians know the Ukrainian version of this poem, and I book paro book motor kozak. So this poem became very popular in Ukraine. It was written and first published in 1798, but it was published many times after this. And during 19th century, 
uh, it was one of the most popular Ukrainian written poems. It's very important to note that at the time Ivan Kotlerevsky lived in the territory of Russian Empire, and Ukrainian language was not seen at the time as a separate language. Uh, when, Ukra uh, when Kotlerevsky wrote this poem, he uh, referred to this poem as to uh, the Virgil's uh, in the interpretation of Virgil's uh, Virgil's character, but uh, he called this as like it was called Ukrainian language till the time was called a little, a little Russian language that was a reference to the Ukrainian territory at the time. And uh, of course, this po poem has a lot of self irony, and uh, it was very uh, well accepted by Ukrainian public, at, as long as it was written of, of the, in the spoken language, and it was and it became extremely popular for this time. So Kotlerevsky is starting a new page in the development of Ukrainian language. Uh, during 19th century. Ukrainian language, modern Ukrainian language, uh, become more popular. And in this time, Kotlerevsky had a lot of followers, a lot of people who started to write also a lot of books, uh, poems, novels, and uh, another form of literary form of writings in Ukrainian language. Ukraine at the time did not have its state good and was instead part of two states, the Austrian monarchy and the Russian Empire. And you can see on the maps this is actually the contemporary Ukraine placed on the, uh, the, on the map of 19th century. Uh, however, despite of this uh, political fragmentation, the literal language and culture of Ukraine continued to develop in both parts of Ukrainian territory, in, on the territory of Russian Empire and on the territory of Austrian Hungarian mo monarchy. The Ukrainian language played a significant role in shaping Ukrainian identity during this time, as it served as a unifying factor for the Ukrainian people who lacked a separate political entity of their own. So the development of modern Ukrainian language that was started by Kotlerevsky led to uh, many uh, further um, uh, uh, many further developments, not only in literature, not only in Ukrainian literature, but also in uh, to uh, the development of uh, codification and standardization of Ukrainian language. It is a very important moment for every language in some historical point of time. As long as uh, we all speak in, in this, we, we all can speak in the same languages, uh, but in a different way. So language is a very vivid structure, and uh, in different regions and different different parts of a country, on every country, and different even in in, in different part of one city, people can speak uh, the same language in different way uh, until until some standard of language uh, appears. And of course, uh, somebody has to create the standard. And that was what was uh, the main um, achievement of Ukrainian, uh, of the study of Ukrainian language in the 19th century. In the 19th century, we can see the first codifications and standardization of Ukrainian language. Uh, first of all, this is the first grammar of modern Ukrainian language uh, that was uh, written by Alexei Pavlovsky in 1818. The first dictionary of Ukrainian language that uh, was published in 1840, and also a very significant role in this development played the almanac in Western Ukraine uh, that was called Rusalka Dnistrova, that was a journal that was devoted to Ukrainian culture in broad, uh, in broad sense. So the Western Ukrainian scholars, mostly from Galicina, from the region that was a part of Austrian Hungarian Empire at that time, uh, contributed to the uh, studies of Ukrainian language, Ukrainian literature, and Ukrainian folklore that was very popular uh, in this historical uh, period. 
period. However, uh, the most important role into the standardization of Ukrainian language uh, played Ukrainian poet Taras Shevchenko. Taras Shevchenko is widely regarded as the key figure in the development of the modern standard of the Ukrainian language. He was a national poet and uh, he is considered the most important literary figure in Ukraine's history. In 1840, he published uh, Kobzar. Uh, Kobzar means the bark. This is a collection of his poems, which became a seminal work in Ukrainian li literature and model for the development of Ukrainian language. The role of Taras Shevchenko in if Ukrainian culture is impossible to describe as long as he, uh, in the 19th century, Taras Shevchenko was revered by Ukrainians and his portrait was often displayed alongside religious icons in homes. His kobzar was a staple in every household and his portrait was memorized and recited by heart by many. Uh, Ukrainian people still have, all Ukrainian people still have this uh, Hiskobzar at home because it is an absolute symbol uh, of Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian language. The language, the type of language that Taras Shevchenko used in Hiskobzar uh, became a model for the further development of Ukrainian language. So, because in Ukrainian language, still there are three uh, biggest dialects. So in different parts of Ukraine, people speak in different dialects and so around 100 sub-dialects. But um, uh, some, uh, uh, the language that uh, Shevchenko spoke became a model, this is a, uh, a model for uh, Ukrainian standard language. And it became also uh, a model some so of some sort of a perfect language. Ukraine, Shevchenko. Uh, uh, is a cult figure in contemporary Ukraine as well. Uh, you can find his monuments, I think, in every Ukrainian city and town. And um, also uh, his uh, poetry is very well known by uh, everyone since childhood. Maybe uh, the most famous poem by Tvastavchenko is his testament. It is also a uh, very important uh, testament for, for all Ukrainians. It's considered to be some sort of the poetry of freedom. As long as if you will talk about the main topics of the poetry of Taras Shevchenko, freedom is the main, the main topics, topic of his uh, poems. Uh, he uh, wrote mostly about Ukraine and the freedom of Ukrainian people. And he uh, wrote about the necessity to gain this freedom. Let's uh, just write this poem to understand actually the general idea of this poetry and why it was so important for Ukrainian and why it is still important. When I'm dead, bury me in my beloved Ukraine, my tomb upon a grave mount high amid the spirit spreading plains so that the fields, the boundless steps, the deepers landing shore, my eyes could see, my ears could hear the mighty river roar. When from Ukraine the Dnieper bears into the deep blue sea, the blue to hose, and will I leave these hills and fertile fields? I leave them all and fly away to the abode of God, and then I pray, but until that day I know nothing of God. Oh, bury me, then rise ye up and break your heavy chains and water with the tyrant's blood the freedom you have gained. And in the great new family, the family of the free without softly spoken can't be worth, remember also me. Uh, Taras Shevchenko uh, is, uh, has a very wide representation in the contemporary Ukrainian culture as well. Uh, his words uh, that ask to fight for freedom uh, are um, widely cited uh, nowadays. Uh, he is a symbol of Ukrainian language and he is a symbol of Ukrainian identity and Ukrainian culture. Coming back to the uh, Ukraine in the 19th century and uh, Ukrainian, the status of Ukrainian language in Ukraine at that time. 
As I have already told you, Ukraine was uh, separated between uh, two uh, states, between Russian Empire and Austrian Hungarian monarchy. However, Ukrainian language was widely spoken on the whole territory of Ukraine. And if you will look on the ethnographical map of Europe, here you can see the, the map of Anatin or all. Uh, we can see on this map actually uh, the uh, territories that is very close to the territory of contemporary Ukraine. It's even a little bit bit uh, broader than the territory of Ukraine, uh, contemporary Ukraine. It's green on the map over the uh, Black Sea. Uh, it's very visible the border of uh, on this map. The border just. Uh, Inside of this inside of this uh, Ukrainian ter territory on this map, this is actually the map that represents uh, Ukrainian language uh, in nineteen or also Ukrainian language was widely spoken on this territory. However, the problem was that it was not uh, recognized as a language. Especially, this problem uh, was. Um, in the territory of Russian Empire. Uh, at this time in 19th century, at this time 19th century is very well known as the national revival of Ukraine. Not only the Shevchenko, but hundreds of names of Ukrainian uh, writers, poets, uh, scholars, historians who uh, devoted their uh, writings to Ukrainian language and another aspect of Ukrainian culture. Uh, those who wrote some writings in Ukrainian language uh, were um, uh, th those who created this um, essence of national Ukrainian revival. Ukrainian language that, that became widely important, however, was not recognized. So in the uh, 19th century, the uh, Russian Empire's language policies towards the Ukrainian language were oppressive, as Ukrainian was not recognized as a distinct language. It was seen as a dialect of Russian that was official Russian politics. This politics uh, also uh, led to a restriction of Ukrainian language. There were a lot of uh, laws that directly banned Ukrainian language. Two of the most uh, famous restrictions were, uh, were related to uh, the so-called Voluev Circular. It was a document uh, that uh, directly told that a separate little Russian Ukrainian language never existed, does not exist, and shall not exist. So that was an official position of Russian Empire concerning Ukrainian language. And actually, the circular uh, banned Ukrainian language. It's uh, a little bit a paradox because how can you ban something that does not exist? But yes, it is a very uh, paradoxical document that bans um, the language and at the same claims that this language does not exist. Uh, the EMS UKAS or the EMS decree uh, also restricted the publishing of Ukrainian language materials since 1860. Uh, 76, uh, it was banned to publish anything uh, in Ukrainian. Of course, these policies had a significant impact on the development of Ukrainian language and culture. Despite these challenges, Ukrainian intellectuals worked to promote the Ukrainian language and establish its distinct identity. Language played a vital role in this movement and efforts were made to create scientific evidence to support the unique cultural identity of Ukraine. Language at the time was a proof of unique cultural identity of Ukraine, actually. As long as the language existed, it was uh, represented Ukraine. Uh, it, it, it was the, the way to show the differences of Ukrainian culture to, to speak Ukrainian language. Another part of Ukraine, anti Austrian monarchy, uh, had a little bit better situation. Uh, national rights, uh, the, the situation regarding language and uh, policies and national rights was different from that of the Russian Empire. Uh, after uh, the December Const Constitution of 1867, uh, that 
uh, was devoted to uh, the provisions for the general rights of nationals, including equality before the law for all ethnicities. Ukrainians uh, were allowed to use and to some sort of promote Ukrainian language. So Ukrainian schools were opened, Ukrainian uh, books were published, Ukrainian societies uh, were established. The Ukrainian language was under development and that allowed for greater linguistic and cultural freedoms and Ukrainian language and culture were able to develop more freely in the regions under Austrian control. However, this also led to some tensions between different ethnic groups within the monarchy. Uh, if you talk about the further development of Ukrainian language in the 19th century, maybe uh, the moment when Ukrainians really had an opportunity uh, to um, make a big step into the development of Ukrainian language, into the uh, standardization of Ukrainian language, was related to the establishment, uh, to, to the establishment of Ukrainian People's Republic. Ukraine had its own statehood for a quite a short amount of time. Only since 1917 till 1921, Ukrainian People's Republic existed. And the official language of this Ukrainian People's Republic was Ukrainian language. It was, uh, there was a law uh, of Ukrainian People's Republic, according to this law, Ukrainian language was a language of government business in the Republic. And uh, of course, uh, it was a significant step of promotion of Ukrainian language. Uh, Ukrainian People's Republic Central Council is connection or something technical problem so i think we cannot hear you right now and see you so culture. Uh, one of the famous uh, one of the famous cultural artifacts of uh, this time you can see on the picture. This is uh, a page from Ukrainian alphabet. It was written by uh, Georgi Narbut a famous Ukrainian graphic designer and director of the Ukrainian Academy of Art. Uh, he was famous because he was the one who created a uh, um, design for all Ukrainian symbols and currency of Ukrainian People's Republic. And Ukrainian alphabet was uh, one of his famous projects and it was also some contribution to Ukrainian identity and to the idea that Ukraine will develop Ukrainian language uh, the interesting thing about this page, uh, please look on the left side on this page, you can see there are two letters of Ukrainian alphabet. The, fan, the first letter uh, we pronounce as G and, uh, and the second as G. So the second letter uh, is the interesting case in uh, further development of Ukrainian language because this letter that existed in Ukrainian language will be banned uh, in 1933 by Ukrainian uh, Soviet uh, orthography. Why to ban a letter? We'll uh, give a several word to this case because it actually can help me to explain what happens after uh, the fall of Ukrainian People's Republic. Ukraine became a part of, Ukra of Soviet Union and uh, it came through several Ukrainian through several uh, different uh, developments. At the very beginning, in the 1920s, uh, the politics of Ukrainization uh, took place in Soviet Union. 
It was a part of so-called politics of colonization. Colonization means indigenization. And the general idea of the Soviet politics was uh, to uh, make uh, national languages of every Soviet Republic uh, the languages of um, communication. And that was actually a time of a very significant development of Ukrainian culture. The early Soviet Union, 1920s, it was time of a really um, of, of many developments of Ukrainian culture, of Ukrainian language. Uh, a lot of Ukrainian um, writers, uh, uh, scholars, poets, they made a lot of contribution to the development of Ukrainian language. However, the time was unfortunately quite short in Ukrainian uh, uh, history. The time of so-called Red Renaissance uh, was uh, finished in the beginning of 1930s. And Ukrainization, the political of Ukrainization stopped and repressions against Ukrainians followed. Uh, the general idea of Joseph Stalin, who uh, wanted to um, create um, some sort of um, entity where Russian language will be the main language of Soviet Union, uh, introduced the general idea that uh, Russian language uh, should uh, prevail in all spheres of life. And uh, his idea was to make Russian language some sort of a world language. Uh, so uh, the ideological sources of the time, he started to promote the idea that uh, all languages are great, but Russian language is better than others. Uh, and uh, that was the beginning of the politics of classification in Soviet Union. Uh, this politics, politics of Russification, uh, had a very significant impact on uh, Ukrainian language. First of all, uh, it's really led to uh, some restriction and some changes in the standards of language. This is quite a um, visible case how uh, Russification was used as a tool of power and how it was impacted on Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture. In 1920s, uh, till, before the beginning of uh, this politics of Russification, uh, in, in, in Ukrainian, lingu Ukrainian linguists uh, has created uh, Ukrainian orthography that was established in Kharkiv. Kharkiv at the time was the capital of Ukrainian Soviet Socialistic Republic. And uh, in ancient sources, it was accused of promoting Ukrainian so-called bourgeois nationalism. Uh, the general politics of Soviet Union was internationalism, so everything that was considered to be a nationalism uh, was uh, seen as dangerous, dangerous and it was mostly banned and restricted. So in 1933, after the Central Committee of uh, the Bolsheviks party issued a resolution on the suppression of nationalism in Ukraine and the introduction of communist ideas, a new Ukrainian orthography was introduced and this new orthography aimed to uh, intentionally create a um, uh, convergence between the Ukrainian and Russian languages. Uh, the case of this uh, idea uh, you can see on the slide and we can talk a little bit about this case to um, explain by what was going on in the situation. Um, the general idea of this new orthography was to um, this whole uh, from Ukrainian language uh, elements, from Ukrainian standard language elements that uh, were seen as those uh, that were influenced by, uh, for example, uh, foreign 
cultures because Ukraine during his development had lots of international influences. And to uh, introduce uh, some lexical choice, uh, lexicography or some uh, uh, word forms that will be similar to Russians. Uh, for example, uh, if traditional Ukrainian word for uh, vegetables was uh, Rodena, uh, the new form that was represented in uh, this 1930s orthography was Ovochi, that was similar to Russian Ovochi. And the same was with many other words like Riska, Tereva, Kati, Kanikule, Kanikule. So uh, the idea of this orthography was to create some sort of average form of Ukrainian language that will be um, of Ukrainian words that will be some sort of uh, words that are similar to Russian words or uh, to, to, to create some uh, forms of um, sentences, some forms of uh, writings, written language that will, um, uh, will be more similar to Russian than to uh, originally Ukrainian words, or especially that was highly criticized by this new uh, orthography, uh, the form that uh, came from uh, the West Ukraine, Western Ukrainian dialect, so as long as uh, the dialect uh, of Ukrainian language that was developed on the territory of the Western regions, it was uh, influenced more by uh, Polish, uh, German words, so it was also criticized because it was seen also as some foreign element in the language. So all those for, for foreign but also originally national Ukrainian elements were eliminated. And to start out of this language, uh, promoted uh, some average form of Ukrainian language that considered to be used, and that was actually the part of this politics of Russification. So, uh, coming back to uh, the band letter. Elena, there are some gray areas on your slides now, probably because of the chat box. Uh, perhaps you can move that something hap is happening with your screen. Okay. Or you can close, the, you can uh -huh. make the slides small again and then again enlarge them and somehow because. Um, or you can. Just tell me when probably you the, the WebEx. Um, this, this, I'm trying, thing. yes. Sorry. The web page of WebEx is there. So mm -hmm. let's try to, yes, reopen it and we can, we can look at all the parts of your okay. slides because okay. some parts of your slides were covered by something, probably the WebEx uh, website or something like that. Yes, now it appears nicely again, and yes, you can make it okay. large and. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. That uh, you. So, so you can now make me. it uh, large again if you like. Okay, maybe maybe I will leave it as it is because I'm afraid that it will be maybe something will happen again right at like this. So. Coming back to this letter, this is actually the banned letter of Ukrainian alphabet. Why it was banned in this new orthography? It was banned because it was also seen as a so called nationalist letter. And uh, this letter had not representation in Russian alphabet, that is actually as Ukrainian and Russian alphabets are both uh, similar as many uh, Slavic. Um, alphabet are similar. So, however, Ukrainian alphabet is different from Russian also. This letter uh, which represents the sound that really exists in Ukrainian language, it was seen as so called, just was called the nationalist letter of Ukrainian alphabet, alphabet because uh, it was related to uh, some words of Ukrainian language that were seen as those that uh, were taken from 
uh, Latin languages, from Polish language, from Polish language, from German language, uh, and so on. It's not really true. So there are lots of actually originally Ukrainian languages that use this letter. However, in Ukrainian language, language there are two sounds uh, that, that are similar one to another. In Russian language, uh, there is only one sound that represents similar sounds. So in Ukrainian, I can tell like uh, Hetman, but but uh, Gazda, and there is like so or uh, hard version of the sound. Uh, it's not there is no this version in Russian language, and yeah, this letter is a case of something that was banned due to eliminate the differences between uh, two languages. Uh, as a part of this politics of Russification and as the, as the part of this general idea of create some sort of Soviet Ukrainian language that will be uh, more uh, the, uh, that will be more similar to Russian and this new standard was developed and promoted in this early Soviet era. Uh, but uh, what is uh, what was more um, from what was more tragic about this uh, time of Ukrainian history? It was not actually a standardization of language. The problem was that uh, uh, the part of uh, Stalin's politics. In nineteen cell in in nineteen thirties was actually um, uh, a physical uh, fight against Ukrainian intellectuals. So, uh, executed Renaissance is a name for a generation of Ukrainian writers, poets, uh, historians, scholars, artists that uh, created Ukrainian culture in 1920s, 1930s, and all were imprisoned and mostly killed uh, by uh, during great terror of 1937-1938. Uh, so the whole generation of Ukrainian um, people who actually created Ukrainian culture was just uh, physically exterminated. And that was really a um, tragic moment of this time. Uh, it's hard to tell about uh, the goal of this um, um, general goal of this activity. Mostly it was about to um, replace the generation of um, uh, people who uh, created culture during the time of uh, Ukrainization by uh, people who were devoted to new supreme values that were developed under Soviet rule. However, uh, this generation uh, includes hundreds of people during uh, this during 1930s around 200 and 60,000 Ukrainians killed under the, great terror, uh, under the Great Terror, and it's not to, to mention a great famine of Ukraine. Uh, there is actually a very nice um, book by uh, American researcher uh, and Apple Baum uh, on that Red famine, Stalin's war against Ukraine. So it was really Stalin's war against Ukraine. And a lot of people were killed, and this generation of Ukrainian uh, linguists, uh, artists, and writers, they just did not survive the 1930s. So uh, this was another part of this politics of Russification. Must, much more dramatic one. If to uh, make some conclusion about uh, the development of Ukrainian culture in this time, uh, the interesting moment that can be added is that 
Ukrainian uh, language and Ukrainian culture was preserved outside of Soviet Union. Um, the development of Ukrainian language and literature was subject to a significant restriction under Soviet rule, but um, the rules of Ukrainian orthography uh, that were that existed in old Ukrainian orthography of 1928 and then they were replaced by, by new rules and 19, at 1930s. Uh, they were uh, used by Ukrainian diaspora all over the world and many significant fiction and scholarly, scholarly writings were created that preserved Ukrainian heritage outside of Ukraine. Uh, for, and another moment in the story is that uh, in Ukraine people did not uh, know about this development as, as because of Iron Curtain, and uh, they revealed this another part of Ukrainian heritage that was preserved outside of Ukraine already after 1991, after Ukraine gained independence in 1991, previously restricted topics returned to the Ukrainian cultural landscape. New studies in Ukrainian language arose and a resentment of the differences between language practices and standards took place. Uh, the banned letter of the Ukrainian alphabet was returned and new development in Ukrainian language and culture took place. Uh, that played an important role in preserving and promoting Ukrainian language and literature, while Ukraine itself, uh, Ukrainian diaspora, saw a revival of Ukrainian identity and culture after decades of Soviet restrictions. Uh, so, to moving on, uh, as long as we already can make a next step to, uh, and come closer to uh, Ukrainian Ukraine. Uh, Today, uh, after uh, in the late Soviet Union, um, the situation with Ukrainian culture became a little bit more uh, free, and uh, Ukrainian culture did uh, really um, did uh, have place uh, for its own development. Uh, however, it was also uh, not easy to tell that it was uh, completely. Um, that, that all uh, pleasures of freedom uh, of thought and of speech was completely uh, in possession of Ukrainian intellectuals. A lot of Ukrainian also were, became a Soviet dissidents even in the uh, time of late Soviet Union. However, uh, in the late 1980s, uh, the democratization of Soviet Union uh, made uh, has brought new opportunities for Ukrainian language, and Ukrainian language uh, became an official language of Ukrainian Soviet Socialistic Republic in 1989. It was a time when uh, Ukrainian national movements were very strong inside of Ukrainian Soviet Socialistic Republic. Uh, the idea of independence uh, was already on the table. Uh, the law of sovereignty was already uh, established in Ukrainian Soviet, uh, in Soviet Ukraine, and after 1991, of course, Ukraine uh, remained the uh, uh, Ukrainian language remained its status of official language, and in 1996, Ukrainian uh, was declared the state language of Ukraine by the Ukrainian Constitution. If to talk about another changes uh, that are relevant to Ukrainian language uh, since 1991, we can underline the ideologization as it was the construction of Soviet Marxist Leninist narratives helped to remove ideological barriers that previously um, uh, hindered the development of Ukrainian language and identity. Identity discussions that uh, took place also uh, in Ukrainian culture. It was significant to understand the role of Ukrainian language and Ukrainian identity as, long as, as Ukraine built its civic identity and uh, uh, contemporary polls um, tell that mostly Ukrainian don't think about um, 
language and the math, the main part of the identity. However, it's also important today. Of course, freedom of thought, the uh, revisiting of intellectual history of Ukraine, uh, the revision of uh, orthography, uh, the uh, general discourses on decolonization, efforts to decolon decolon decolonize literature and Ukrainian studies have helped to uh, understand and to reveal a new um, path of Ukrainian language as it is. Uh, during the society of 91, new, gener new generation grew up, a new generation of Ukrainians with different values and perspectives. Perspectives has emerged, bringing fresh ideas and perspectives to the development of Ukrainian language. And of course, the new idea that was established in Ukraine was the idea of multilingualism. A multicultural and multilingual approach has fostered a more diverse and inclusive understanding of Ukrainian language, allowing it to thrive in a global context. And uh, here I will uh, cover the last question. For today, actually, language is in Ukraine. Ukrainian language, of course, is official language in Ukraine, and it is language for most Ukrainians. 76% um, of Ukrainian people think about Ukraine as about the mother tongue. Uh, however, Ukraine's multicultural and multilingual heritage uh, has resulted in the Ukrainian language being enriched and influenced by a variety of languages through exchange and interaction. And this interaction has also allowed the Ukrainian language to have an impact on other languages. Uh, many Ukrainian, uh, on the territory of Ukraine, many famous um, people who uh, represented in other languages and made, made contribution uh, to the world literature and culture were born. And Ukrainian language uh, could exist also in Ukrainian territory with other languages. Uh, Ukraine as a multilingual as a multilingual culture, as a country where people speak Ukrainian, Russian, Crimean Tatars, Moldavian, Hungarian, Romanian, Bulgarian, Belarusian, Armenian, and in other languages. So, of course, the context, I can't avoid this question, the context of the war uh, has changed the attitude to Ukrainian language and to uh, the language spoken in Ukrainian territory. Despite all the fact that most Ukrainian people uh, speak Ukrainian language as their mother tongue, uh, the second spoken language in the Ukrainian territory is actually the Russian language, and uh, contemporary polls uh, shows that uh, many people after the beginning of full scale Russian in invasion have decided to switch their languages uh, from Russian to Ukrainian. This is actually a fact of contemporary Ukrainian situations. The idea to rethink Ukrainian identity and to give more, um, well, to, 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 to stay as far as possible of uh, this heritage of Russification that took place for centuries in the Ukrainian territory and to uh, come closer to Ukrainian language that is visible as a basement or a symbol of Ukrainian culture and identity. And uh, of course, uh, I think that um, current developments uh, will uh, very visible, um, uh, will be very visible uh, in the closest future, as long as really um, situation is change and people um, make a new perspective onto, onto languages, uh, thinking about languages as about um, the significant way to show its belonging to um, Ukraine and Ukrainian culture. So I will make here a little pause for questions as long as, long as we promote the idea of discussion. And after that, I will back to uh, Ukrainian languages. So are there any questions here? Please pause me them if you have them. So you okay. can raise your virtual hand or you can use the chat. Uh, if you raise your hand, we can unmute your microphone or 
and then of course you can open your camera as well or you can use the chat um see if there are any questions a lot of information of course again about them uh, unfortunately we don't know many things but it's very informative and very nice all the presentation was very very nice and very informative and very interesting and i see there is a question by marina uh, about Enid and the alphabet uh, uh in wow. which alphabet was the Enid, the first modern ukrainian uh book Thank you very much. It was written in the Cyrillic alphabet. It's a great question, actually. Ukrainian language used this alphabet since uh, medieval times. So old Ukrainian language also uses Cyrillic alphabet. So modern Ukrainian language follows this tradition. And uh, Ukraine actually never used any sort of, for example, Latin alphabet. However, at the end of 19th century, there was an idea to switch to some sort. So there were some scholars who thought that it might be that it might be a good idea to uh, change the Cyrillic alphabet to uh, Latin alphabet. Right? Um, however, it, this idea was never popular as long as at the time of the um, at 1798, uh, at this time. Uh, Ukrainian, old Ukrainian language also existed, and Ukraine was a part of um, Russian Empire, which also used Cyrillic alphabet. So that was the alphabet that was written uh, in Cyrillic as a traditional Ukrainian alphabet. Uh, and actually, it was like old Cyrillic alphabet. It uh, came through some changes, I guess. In uh, it's already uh, in nineteen thirties, it came through the process of modernization. However, it was the same Cyrillic alphabet. Thank you for your question. Wonderful question. I don't know if we have any other. Yes, Nikos has a question oh. here. What were the, the main influences for? Uh, of early Ukrainian literature on on the early Ukrainian literature. Um. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, I would tell there are um, three main main influence. First of all, uh, Ukraine uh, became a Christian country at the end of 10th century, and by that an influence was the most uh, visible influence. In Ukraine, uh, there were two languages in use, Old Ukrainian and Church Slavonic languages. So th that was two different languages. Church Slavonic languages was the language that was used mostly for religious purposes, but it was uh, definitely influenced to some extent to the literary language, not much, but it did. Uh, however, from uh, Byzant Byzantine influence, the uh, very visible uh, influence of Greek language obviously was um, um, uh, Greek languages that came from Byzantium, uh, from East Roman Empire. It was very visible influence on Ukrainian language. Also, people spoke at the time it was a uh, uh, educated people yes they spoke uh, old ukrainian church slavonic also greek language uh, also we can uh, tell about um, in a late uh, time in i think since 12th uh, 13th century the influence of uh, the west european influences at that time uh, after uh, in the 13th century uh, the uh, central part of Ukraine uh, was uh, fall under the uh, Mongol invasion. However, uh, the west of Ukraine uh, remained uh, its um, uh, status of um, independent uh, state for some time, but uh, it had a lot of Latin influences many Polish influences, and uh, it was mostly 
uh, the interesting moment in the development of this early uh, literature already in Sutin, but especially in Hutin's century, was that uh, there were uh, books written in Latin language in Ukraine, as look as it was a um, uh, language of uh, educated Europe, so that it also took place on the territory of Ukraine. The books that were written by, by Ukrainian authors in Latin languages, and also in the books in this in this time, it, they were like uh, influenced by this um, culture uh, that was close to the west of uh, Ukraine. And also, I have not mentioned about the earliest uh, the earliest uh, they read about Bulgarian influences uh, that took place around 9th, 10th century. So I would underline these three influences. Uh, for right. the medieval literature of Ukraine. If you will talk about later time, like about middle, middle there is also, I told that there is old Ukrainian and modern Ukrainian language. However, um, if you will go uh, deeper into this question, there is like a uh, part of old Ukrainian language that is known as middle Ukrainian language, something between old and modern. Uh, this is a language since 14th century and, land, uh, and later, so writings were uh, mostly influenced by the European culture. Uh, Ukraine at the time was a part of Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And, yeah, that was, uh, we can see a visible uh, relation to European culture. Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainians at the time mostly uh, received education in European um, uh, universities, so it was Polish influence most of all. Thank you for your question. So, I don't know if you have any much. other questions. I have a question about the the position and the and the future of the Ukrainian language in I mean European and American universities. Probably you know well what is happening right now. I know that nowadays there is a I mean a Harvard Center of Ukrainian Studies and other initiatives. And um, what about that? Or uh, what about the future of Ukrainian in, in uh, universities abroad? Or in Thank you very much for the great question. Uh, you are right, uh, there are, uh, we can see a growth of the centers for Ukrainian studies today. Uh, the most significant center, as you uh, have mentioned, uh, in Harvard and Cambridge, and the, uh, the oldest uh, one is uh, Canadian Center for Ukrainian Studies, uh, as I guess it started its existence since um, 19... Um, 60s, I guess. Uh, Ukrainian language programs uh, are very well developed, really, in English speaking countries. Like, in, for, for some reason, Britain and USA, they have more Ukrainian, um, uh, more places for children in Ukrainian. In Europe, uh, there are uh, several. Um, mostly several um, programs that uh, in Europe, mostly Ukrainian language studies as part of um, Slavic uh, studies. It's more common for Ukrainian language. It can be East, uh, part of East Slavic or Slavic studies or Slavonic studies. Uh, however, during this time, you can see really uh, the, um, the significant increasing of the interest to Ukrainian language. So I think that uh, it have it has a very great future perspectives. And uh, I think that the London Institute of um, Ukraine uh, has created a site where they gather together all Ukrainian centers abroad, and it's like over one hundred over one hundred centers that's devoted to the um, different uh, to, to the study of different aspects of Ukraine outside of Ukraine, not necessarily the language, but it's some uh, in some relation to Ukraine. So there are over 100. So I think that 
uh, in future maybe it will become more uh, we will we will see more attention to Ukrainian language because it was really um, uh, for a long time even after the independence of Ukraine it was overshadowed by um, uh, another Slavic languages but now there is more attention to Ukraine so maybe it will be seen as more uh, valuable uh, subject for scientific research and for learning. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much. And another question. Um, did Ukrainian scholars uh, later write down traditional Ukrainian stories during the medieval times to preserve them? So preservation of the language. Um, Uh, did Ukrainian scholars later write down traditional Ukrainian stories? Um, so this is a question about how, how they preserve the language and how they, uh, it happens with the, um, uh, writing or keeping a track of um, uh, fairy tales or things like that, or songs or other poems yes. during the medieval uh, times. It happens with uh, some languages. So there's this kind of preservation of the language of the written. Uh, thank you very time. much. It's just a very great uh, question because actually, 19th century is the time when uh, in Ukraine there was a very great interest to Ukrainian folklore. And I think that the thousand fairy tales were written at the time. I'm not sure that we can identify them as medieval because actually, uh, this. Um, happened already in the 19th century, so may, maybe it's mostly about modern time. And if you will tell about this modern and contemporary uh, time, it's like I, I will define uh, 19th century and at, as the moment of time when uh, really um, all these traditional stories were written down and uh, it was a time of the high interest to Ukrainian traditional culture, to Ukrainian folklore, so not only stories, a lot of Ukrainian traditions were written down, a lot of Ukrainian songs, uh, lyrics of Ukrainian songs, which is a very important part of Ukrainian culture, music, Ukraine, traditional Ukrainian music. Uh, they really all, all were very well studied at this time, and uh, they are quite well preserved. So in Ukraine, the traditional culture is very well preserved, but maybe uh, closer to the model of 19th century, not to the medieval time. In medieval time, we have just uh, less information uh, due to the specific historical situations that uh, since um, uh 13th century Ukraine had uh, Ukraine was a part of another since 14th century Ukraine was a part of another state and this new revival of interest to traditional Ukrainian culture happened only in the age of 18 and uh, in 18th century and in this time yes really uh, a lot of traditional stories and a lot of interesting um, artifacts of this folklore folklore culture was written down. Thank you for this question. This is actually, yes, this is an amazing question because this part of Ukrainian culture is very important. Thank you, Alina. And any other questions? Um, yes, there is here a question by Sotiria. I'm studying international re relations at the master's level. Um, And so Tira says has has a comment about how interesting the the lecture is. I think we all agree. Um, any other questions? Or thank you very much for this comment. Uh, thank you very much for this comment. It's really great that it has relevant. Um, And I think we have some minutes uh, left for more questions, if you like. The 
another question about the recommendation of oh, yeah. literature written in Ukrainian. Probably we can read something translated into English or other languages, but we can learn something about Ukrainian literature as well. So what about famous texts uh -huh. uh, that we may read in the future or I mean I mean you mentioned several. Yeah. Actually, yes, actually, as uh, so, so actually I understand it is about new uh, Ukrainian writers. It's a very great question because also during class years, uh, you can see a lot of translations. So uh, I would recommend several sources if uh, to talk about uh, those who uh, to, to talk about uh, classical Ukrainian writers, since they are really translated to English, not in, not all of them, but some of them, so there is this lack of translation, however, there are translations, and, and in the end of the lecture, I will send you a site where you can find a lot of information about Ukrainian translations in English, it will be in the chat, and uh, there you can find actually all of the classics of Ukrainian liter literature. And if uh, to tell about contemporary Ukrainian uh, authors, maybe I will uh, recommend uh, several uh, interesting names uh, that definitely has a translation of uh, Ukrainian poet and writer uh, Sergei Zhadan. He is well known, he is contemporary, he is contemporary writer. He is well known for, for his poetry and novels that depicts actually the war in Ukraine since, since 2014 when the war started uh, in Ukraine. He makes a great contribution and he is quite popular among Ukrainian writers. He already has published, I think it's already, already translated his recent uh, work it is a diary about uh, Russian invasion uh, it is called the sky over Kharkiv which is actually um, his diary of his uh, um, impressions he, he spends all his time in Kharkiv which is actually the east of Ukraine's uh, part uh, where the situation is maybe one of the hardest and he uh, writes about his expression and experience of being in the city uh, in this, um, uh, um, uh, been in the city since the beginning of Russian post scanning in, in Russian till now, so it might, might be quite interesting to read this. And also, his uh, elder, older writings are uh, also in a similar, um, has also similar ideas. He devoted his write, writing to some, this, to some. Uh, um, uh, some um, contemporary uh, problems of Ukraine, especially uh, in the context of the war. Uh, maybe also it will be more relevant if I will um, send you to the chat another, um, not one, but two references there is also a site where you can find a lot of recommendations about contemporary ukrainian writings already with the translations this one i would like to underline because it is maybe the most popular um the most uh, relevant topic for today however it's like first it comes to the mind however in other writings yes there are also a lot of interesting historical books written in Ukraine. I have to check up what is translated into Ukrainian language. For Oksana Zabushko is a Ukrainian writer who uh, writes about uh, some feminist uh, introductions to Ukrainian field. There is Tatiana Malerchuk, she is publishing, I think she's in English. Historical novels about, novels about Ukrainian history. Um, three things that I will recommend right now and all others I will send you uh, right in several right after the end of our talk and you can check up them by yourself. Thank you for this question. This is great and we can use the Google uh, folder and perhaps we can upload there more information about what you mentioned um, Elena or we can create a, a blog or, or a platform something like that and we can exchange information and collect 
material and then students can have access to that and all people of the university. Uh, Olya has here uh, another suggestion about a book actually translated into, into Greek. So you can find the reference um, in the chat box. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And Thank this you very book much. has been translated into Greek. So oh, uh, all right. of us and, and, and the students and all of us and colleagues I can find this book and perhaps we can collect all this information and we can create something um, for the future as well. So, and for everybody to have access to this information um, after the end of the, of the lectures as well. Of course, we're going to upload the lectures and, and the video again, find this information, but perhaps we can create something, a website or a platform and we can Thank you very much. It's just a great idea. I think really that it would be great to create this like uh, a list of references that will be mm -hmm, useful mm -hmm. for everybody who is interested in Ukrainian language and culture. Mm -hmm. and do this. It would be. It, it's really it's a great idea. Thank you. And then some we'll information about senders where people can can learn Ukrainian yeah. um, uh -huh. probably in the future, and yes. what they can find in in, in Greece as well. Okay. Great. Probably we have two, three minutes left for questions, comments, or other thoughts before we say goodbye for today. And we continue next uh, Wednesday again, six o'clock at six o'clock Athens time. That's five o'clock Vienna time uh, and six o'clock Kiev time, actually. Um, okay. So, any other questions before? Kiev and Athens have the same time. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments? Other... I think that this is about, yes, it will create this source and, yeah. So if we don't have any other questions, we will thank Elena again very, very much. Thank you very much. All this these event. lectures, Thank you, so interesting information yeah. about yeah. things we unfortunately not know. Um, and we are very happy to learn about all these topics and, and about Ukrainian and Ukraine. Um, so we continue, of course, um, and we'll be here again next uh, Wednesday, okay, at six o'clock. And we'll probably uh, create a, a platform or a website. Um, to uh, have all information there available about the references, the books. So thank you all, and thank you, Helena, very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for this wonderful event, and thank you all that you are here. Thank you.